Argentina's Vice President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner said she is a victim of lawfare and media persecution. Social and workers' movements, as well as political leaders, have ratified their support to the Vice President. Hundreds gathered to attend the funeral of Dania Dugina in Moscow, the daughter of the intellectual Alexander Dugin, who was killed in a car bombing. And UNICEF warns that children in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel are in need of urgent support as they face severe malnutrition and the risk of waterborne diseases. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The vice president of Argentina, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, described the lawfare against her as a judicial media firing squad. Social and workers' movements, as well as political leaders, have ratified their support to the vice president. This Monday, Cristina Fernandez criticized the decision of a court in the federal capital that refused to allow her to extend her deposition in the case where she is accused of alleged irregularities in the awarding of public works when she was president. In this sense, she announced that this Tuesday she will defend herself through her social networks where she will provide details about the case known as Vialidad or Roadworks. In Argentina, without evidence and with witnesses that deny the accusations, the prosecution requests a 12-year prison sentence and a lifetime suspension for the Vice President Cristina Fernandez. In the ninth and last plea hearing, Prosecutor Sergio Mola and Diego Luciani requested on Monday 12 years of imprisonment for Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner in the so-called Vialidad case, which investigates alleged corruption cases. Fernandez, who has political immunity due to her position as vice president and president of the Senate, has been on trial since 2019 along with 12 other people for allegedly directing bids for public roadworks in the province of Santa Cruz between 2003 and 2015. The prosecutor accuses her for alleged crimes of aggravated illicit association and aggravated mismanagement against the public treasure when she was president of the country. Prosecutor Luciani also requested that the vice president and the rest of a former official charged be permanently banned from holding public office. For the sentence to be enforced, it must be ratified by the Supreme Court of Justice. Therefore, even if convicted, Fernandez remains free and could be a candidate in a 2023 presidential and legislative elections. The sentence is based on new accusations that were not included in that trial. Almost all of their arguments come from other files that the judges authorized them to use on the last day of the trial. This is to say that they were never discussed in the hearings, a case in which their own witnesses denied the accusations against Fernandez. On Monday afternoon, the second federal oracle rejected the vice president's request to extend her statement during Tuesday's hearing. After learning of the ruling, Fernandez stated that she's not before a court of a constitution, but before a media judicial firing squad, which denies her the right to the exercise of defense in the face of issues that never appeared in the prosecutor's indictment that she attended in 2019. Fernandez said that through her social media network she will demonstrate why she is not allowed to speak at the trial after the script that she claims the prosecutors put together, especially Luciani, who has a personal relationship with one of the members of a tribunal, Rodrigo Jimenez Uriburu, with whom he played football matches at the country house of former President Mauricio Macri. On Monday, a journalist was shot dead in southern Mexico as the toll and such incidents rise to 15. Freddy Roman used to publish his work on various social media platforms and contributed to the local newspaper. He was found dead in his car in the city of Chilpancingo, Guerrero State, as confirmed by the local prosecutor's office. A few hours before his death, Roman published a long Facebook post titled State Crime Without Charging the Boss, in which he mentioned an alleged meeting between four officials at the time of the student's disappearance, including the former Attorney General Jesus Murillo Garam.
Murillo Karam was arrested after the publication of the Truth Commission reports last week, while thousands of warrants were issued for suspects, including military personnel, police officers, and cartel members. On Monday, Colombia has decided to abandon the Geneva Consensus, supported by 36 pro-life or anti-abortion countries. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the decision aligns with the new government's commitment to the promotion of women's health and their needs. In a document sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil, the country where the consensus was signed on May 13th, it stated that the anti-abortion consensus will go against the Constitution and the jurisprudence of the court. The right to legal and safe abortion is an integral part of sexual and reproductive rights in the women's sexual and reproductive health. In May, Colombia adhered to the Geneva Consensus by former President Ivan Duque, alongside Guatemala, the U.S., and Haiti, joined by Arab, African, Muslim, and some European countries, such as Poland. Although the document had no legal weight, it had symbolic weight and placed Colombia as an anti-abortion country. On Monday, Peru's health ministry confirmed over a thousand monkeypox cases. Health authorities have assured that the disease is to be found in 16 regions, including Lima. Warnings were also issued given the high rate of infection affecting homosexual men. Of the total confirmed cases, 1,119 are reported to be men. That is a 99.2% and only nine cases are women. 0.80% health ministry spokesperson said. There are 775 male homosexual patients representing 68.7%, 105 heterosexual patients, 9.31% and 248 patients, 22% whose sexual orientation is not specified. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo responded on Monday to a restriction imposed by the Attorney General's office on his wife, Lilia Paredes, which prohibits her from leaving the country for six months. In a meeting with his supporters in Trujillo, Castillo declared that both he and his family will be proven innocent. In the same sense, the leader of the Peruvian executive pointed out that the judicial cases against him are due to the fact that his government advanced against the interests of the most powerful and in favor of the dispossessed. Castillo and several of his family members, including his wife, as well as former cabinet ministers, are being investigated for allegedly being part of a criminal organization for money laundering. When we touch the interests of those in power, those who do not want to pay taxes and have nothing else to do, but rather take it out on families, those around us. In Haiti, at least one person was killed during demonstrations by social and political organizations against insecurity, fuel shortages, and the high cost of living. Authorities reported that the victim died during an attack by an army group that fired numerous shots as the demonstrators passed by. Besides demonstrations in the capital, thousands of people have protested in other cities in Haiti, such as the case in Cabaret, to denounce the government's inaction. Haiti is facing a social, political, and economic crisis marked by inflation, depreciation of the local currency, high cost of living, fuel shortages, and the increase in armed attacks by the groups fighting over territory control. Today we live in a society where people cannot eat nor drink. Being young, we understand the social problems. If the conditions of the most vulnerable people are in a change, we still um, will stay on the streets. We will bring a new vision to see if the young people can breathe. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In the United States, a young man brutally beaten by will being arrested by three police officers in the state of Arkansas has been released on bail. 
27-year-old Randall Worcester was released Monday after being arrested on charges of terrorist threats, resisting arrest and assault in the city of Mulberry. The young man had to be treated at a hospital on Sunday after three police officers violently arrested him, beating him repeatedly and was later transferred to the Van Buren County Yale. The three officers were suspended from the force while investigation is underway. In a related news, our Gonzaga governor, Asa Hutchinson, held a press conference Monday where he condemned the actions of the officers and said that the Department of Justice will be conducting a separate investigation from that of the Arkansas State Police. ...was not consistent with the training that they received as certified officers with the Arkansas Law Enforcement Training Academy. That would be investigated by the state police. I understand that the U.S. Attorney and the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice will be conducting a separate investigation. According to a survey from the National Investigation and Association for Business Economics, the United States Federal Reserve is unlikely to bring inflation down without pushing the economy into a recession. Citing the survey, 72 percent of the economists polled expect the next U.S. recession will begin by the middle of next year. Roughly one-fifth of the panelists believe the country is already in recession, while nearly half the panelists expect it to begin by the end of 2022. Some 73 percent of the economists indicated they are not very confident, or not at all confident, that the Fed will be able to bring inflation down to its 2 percent goal within the next two years. In March, experts view monetary policy as too stimulative. Since then, the Federal Open Market Committee approved four consecutive rate hikes, lifting the benchmark interest rate from 2.25% to 2.50%. The monkeypox virus has reached all 50 states in the United States after Wyoming became the last one to confirm the existence of the disease. The Wyoming Department of Health announced the first monkeypox case in a local resident in Laramie County. Updated data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show that more than 15,000 confirmed monkeypox cases had been reported nationwide. New York had the most cases, with nearly 3,000, followed by California with 2,663, and Florida with 1,588. Some public health experts said that the actual total number of cases may be higher than the official data due to delays of collection of data and lack of testing and vaccination. Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced an independent inquiry into his predecessor, Scott Morrison, secretly appointing himself to multiple ministries during the COVID-19 pandemic. Albanese made public the move on Tuesday after Solicitor General Stephen Donahue concluded that while Morrison's appointments were legal, they constituted an unprecedented assumption of power and fundamentally undermined responsible government. During the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021, the former Prime Minister secretly took over the charge of five ministries, including health, finance, treasury and home affairs, industry, science and resources, despite there were officials appointed to those ministries. Now we move on to other topics. Hundreds gathered to attend the funeral of Daria Dugina in Moscow, the daughter of intellectual Alexander Dugin, who was killed in a car bombing. Mourners paid their respects to Daria Dugina at a hall in Moscow's Ostankino TV Center, while her black and white portrait was displayed over an open casket. According to preliminary investigations, Alexander Dugin, a strong supporter of President Vladimir Putin, may have been the intended target of the attack that killed his 29-year-old daughter. The Russian head of state expressed his sincere condolences and stated it was a vile and cruel crime that will not go unpunished.
And now we move on to other topics. People from the Sudanese village of Makilab recovered their belongings after floods caused by torrential rains that killed at least 52 people and damaged or destroyed thousands of homes. In the North African country, heavy rains usually fall between May and October, and the country faces severe flooding every year, wrecking property, infrastructure, and crops. According to official figures, in 2022, floods have killed at least 20, 79 people and left thousands homeless. Recently, the government declared a state of emergency due to floods in six states, including River Nile. The crisis came as Sudan rails from deepening political unrest and spiraling economic crisis exacerbated by the military coup in 2021. Autumn has just started and people are worried that there will be more rains and there is no place to stay. Not all families have tents and we are worried for the children's safety as there are scorpions and snakes. People are really worried about what, they he what the heavy rain could bring with it. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. The United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF, warned that children in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel region could die in devastating numbers unless urgent support is provided as severe malnutrition and the risk of waterborne disease collide. The number of people in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia without reliable access to safe water has risen from 9.5 million to 16.2 million in five months putting children and their families in increased danger of contracting illnesses like cholera and diarrhea. Meanwhile, children in the Sahel are also facing extremely high levels of water vulnerability. According to the latest data from the World Health Organization, already more children die because of unsafe water and sanitation in the region than in any other part of the world. Most people in the Horn of Africa rely on water delivered by vendors or the trucks on donkey carts. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi met with the leaders of the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Jordan and Iraq ahead of a five-way Arab summit in the Mediterranean city of El Alamein. The Egyptian leader held talks with UIS Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nijan, Jordan's King Abdullah II, Bahraini King Sheikh Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa, and Iraq's Prime Minister Mustafa al Kadimi on ways to strengthen bilateral relations and cooperation between their countries. Among other topics discussed were the conflicts in Yemen, Syria, and Libya, and the latest Israel's assault on besieged Gaza earlier this month. The meeting took place in Alamein City, northwestern Egypt, the scene of one of the fiercest battles of World War II that helped decide the conflict's outcome. And part of the remaining grain silos at the Beirut port collapsed amid non-extinguished fire in Lebanon. It was the third collapse in a row since July at the silos which are in the vicinity of and damaged by the devastating explosion at the Beru port on August 4, 2020. The blast costed 200 lives, injured over 6,000 people, and left hundreds of thousands with other homes and properties. Since July, sporadic fires occur in the northern side of the silos due to the burning of remaining grains caused by the high temperature in the summer. The first collapse happened on July 31st, followed by a further collapse on the structure on August 4th. The Lebanese government is considering a demolition of the northern facade of the silos while keeping and reinforcing the southern side. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesoryenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. 
And now you can also follow us on TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and more. For Telesur English, I'm your anchor Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.